Matthew Sklar and Bob Martin are two of the creators of Broadway's The Prom, and now the film version of the musical comedy is hitting Netflix on December 11th. Produced and directed by Ryan Murphy, the film features a star-studded cast, including Meryl Streep, James Corden, Nicole Kidman, and many more. I'm here to talk to the composer and co-screenwriter about building a prom for the masses. Let's get this party started! It's time to build a prom for everyone. Show them all. It can be done if music plays and no one cares. Who your unruly heart loves, build it now. Well, I just saw the premiere, and I can't tell you how excited I was to let some zazz into my home. So <laughs> tell me about what it was like for you to watch The Prom the first time. Well, the first time we saw an early director's cut, I think we were just kind of blown away. We were kind of shocked at how close it was to the original show and, and thrilled. And, and, and we were crying all the way through. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, there's like absurd moments seeing your name in the vicinity of Meryl <laughs> Streep's name. And then there's just the moments like the final prom when everyone enters or, or like so many moments when I was just weeping anyway. I, yeah, Matt. Yeah. You... And well, just, um, just the scale of everything, it, you know, something we just can't do on stage and, and we can't create in the orchestra pit either. Um, you know, so just that coming at you in this beautiful world, um, you know, and through, you know, Ryan's lens, but also really um, being faithful to the show, uh, he, cre he, he kind of, you know, was able to create a, a, a real balance of those things and it made it so satisfying. And, and yeah, I mean, the first time I saw it and those, and those kids came out and it's time to dance. And, yeah. you know, I was there that day when they shot that and all those kids are LGBTQ, you know, youth and they were, um, you know, and they didn't let them see the set um, until they rolled. <laughs> So those re reactions are genuine from them. And it's just every time I see it, I'm just a bucket of tears. It's just yeah. so moving. Yeah. It's very emotional. Yeah. But let's go back to when the prom mm -hmm. was on Broadway. Ugh, I love the prom on Broadway. <laughs> and Ryan Murphy went to see it. And then I guess you guys got a call. How did that all work out? And what was your reaction? Go well, ahead, Matt. You remember this sort of an idea. Yeah, uh, Bill, <laughs> Bill Damashki, our one of our lead producers on Broadway, um, had been trying to get Ryan to see the show for a while, and then finally, you know, one night in January of uh, 2019, we had only been open for a couple of months. Um, Ryan showed up at, with Bill, um, and I knew he was going to be there, so I, you know, I snuck in the back of the theater to see what was going on, and. Um, and uh, at the end of the show, Bill introduced me to Ryan and, and Ryan said, um, he just looked at me and he said, I, uh, I don't know you, but I'm very proud of you. And I have some thoughts, some good thoughts. And then, I, I, he, and then he and Bill left. And then a couple of days later, we got this phone call saying that he wanted to make it and, and uh, make it a feature film. Um, so it was, uh, you know, it was, it, it came as a complete surprise to us. Um, but it really spoke to him. You know, he grew up gay in Indiana and he he faced a lot of the same problems that Emma faced. So it's very, very personal to him. Um, and, uh, you know, he said, uh, and then Bob and I met him in Los Angeles when he was, you know, trying to, when we were getting everything going and he just said- On the set every, of Ratchet. Actually. Yeah, on the set of Ratchet. We were in like a haunted house. Yeah, and we were like sitting <laughs> on the set, and Ryan was behind this giant desk, and Bob were in the, Bob and I were in these little chairs, um, and he basically just told us, you know, his thoughts and his and his vision for it, and and the fact that he, you know, he wanted Casey to stage all the numbers, and uh, you know, he really said he wanted to honor what we did, but he could open it up in a cinematic way, and it's exactly what he did. So, Bob, tell me about writing the screenplay with Chad. It's not a foregone conclusion that the writers of a Broadway musical will get the chance to adapt their own work. That's right. So um, we were so grateful to be, you know, to be able to work directly with Ryan on on writing the thing and not have to deal with additional writers who might be hired onto the project, which is fairly typical for these types of things. So it was just the two of us and Ryan. Um, uh, and because we were in different cities and and eventually because of the pandemic, we did it all pretty well all of it remotely. Um, 
and Ryan would say, I want to go deeper into uh, Barry's backstory, you know, and uh, write me a scene that, that allows us to understand what his relationship was like with his mother or something like that. And and we would write that material and send it back and forth. This is great. We get the response. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a big machine, uh, a, a major Hollywood film like this. So, and we're just sort of throwing material into the machine, not knowing exactly what will happen in the end. Um, but as I say, he was so surprisingly respectful <laughs> and, and just kept everything intact. And it was really fun to, you know, write uh, the scene on the bus, them going down to Indiana <laughs> on the tour bus and, you know, things that we just simply couldn't do on stage. Um, yeah. So it was a, it was really, really a, a really positive experience. This piece attracted such a top-notch cast on Broadway and, of course, in the film. I mean, you've got Meryl Streep and James Corden, and Nicole Kidman. Did you feel like you had won the lottery? Was it like a pinch me moment when you were hearing about the casting of this of this film? Yeah. Well, again, uh, Matt, you can confirm this, but there was a sort of slow parade of major celebrities coming to the show on Broadway, and we were starting to get suspicious that something was afoot. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then it turned out that most of those people um, were in the movie. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was it was wonderful. I mean, uh, because of their presence in the film, this thing uh, is able to be made and is going to have a global audience. You know, more. it was frustrating because we we were we had a a really solid following of fans of the show, and and um, we had great critical reception. But we, we, you know, we were struggling on Broadway, and it wasn't as long a run as we had hoped. So now with the movie, more people will see it, on uh, you know, on the first day that it streamed, than saw the entire run, and 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 you know, this message, and and and, and these conversations will take place in homes all over the world on that first day in a way that we could never have imagined. Um, yeah, yeah, and I and I and I just hope that you know, all these people will discover this movie. And then they will go discover the original Broadway company who is extraordinary and the cast album. And uh, you know, they can coexist in this world because um, they're, they're both extraordinary. Matt, tell me what it was like on the set. Um, Give me a taste. I, I went, uh, I was there for two months. I, went, I just said, I'm not missing this. I need to see this in person. So they let me uh, they they let me be on set as as often as I wanted, and um, it was just a, an amazing experience watching a film get made. It's it's so different than theater. You know, theater. You know, you throw it all up, and it's all there. And you know, the movie making process is slow. It's kind of like being in tech rehearsal for a long time because everything you know there's lots of setup time and and downtime. And um, but one thing that you know struck me was just how much fun everybody was having. The cast, you know, was constantly joking around and having a great time and rehearsing, you know, I remember I walked out, um, you know, uh, you know, in the holding area one day and I just saw all of the leads uh, just practicing it's time to dance just together. You know, nobody was watching. They were just, they were just rehearsing just like, you know, you would any, any show. And it was so thrilling. And, um, but one day that I'll, I'll never forget is, we were at an Applebee's somewhere in California and I was in a little video village out in the grass and watching the close up take of Meryl Streep just listening to Keegan-Michael Key sing, We Look To You. And I think they did it three times. Watching her react for the entire length of the song, it was extraordinary just to see a film actor of that caliber just do her thing um, and reacting to the, song the the song that chad and i wrote in this apartment is just kind of surreal and it was really a wonderful thing and um you know what i mean what an experience and bob I, you got to revisit these characters were there some discoveries that you made that you hadn't made during the time of the musical on broadway yeah absolutely um well first of all we 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 got to actually bring the grandmother into the story Emma's uh, grandmother, which we couldn't do on, on stage. Um, as I think it was Matt, you said, you know, Casey was just not interested in having an ensemble member in a gray wig for one scene. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. Just, we just couldn't do it in the, <laughs> on, in the Broadway show. 
So that what we were able to do it there. So getting getting into um, that story and hearing how from her lips how difficult uh, Emma's coming out was 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 a significant addition to the story. Uh, and then there's Barry's whole backstory and and eventual. Well, I don't want to give anything away, but uh, but we we get to understand more about his relationship with his mother. Um, and that becomes actually a third storyline in the show, really. Uh, um, so that was uh, that was great to be able to do that. the The thing that's significantly different, I think, is is how deep we went into the final prom itself. How how what an incredibly optimistic message it is at the end of the movie. Um, just simply, uh, just flashier, more beautiful, more more exuberant than we could have um, done on, on the Broadway stage. Plus uh, Matt and Chad wrote this great song that sort of, <laughs> it's an additional song at the end of the show that sort of uh, embraces that feeling of energy and celebration. Yeah, that was really fun. Um, Ryan asked us, uh, Chad, Chad and me to collaborate with um, the his, his frequent uh, music team and they produce all the music for the film, but they're like pop music geniuses. So Ryan wanted a pop song um, to play over the end credits. And what I love about it, it was, first of all, it was really fun to write, but second of all, it just allows you to sit in the feeling of joy at the end of it's time to dance um, for, for another three minutes. And the story keeps going the way Ryan cut it with picture. Um, but I think it, it, it's really effective in the movie and, uh, and I'm just glad that, you know, that it's there. It's just a big party. And you feel like you're in the middle of the greatest party of all time. Yeah. How did you write that song? And and did you know which characters would mm -hmm. be singing it? Well, Ryan said, I want something for the women. I think the women of the cast should sing this. It's about female empowerment. It's about pride. Um, so uh, basically the guys, uh, Adam Anders and Pierre Astrom, who are, who are um, the co-writers on the song, um, they they produced this great track and then uh, they wrote the hook and then Chad and I took the verse and the bridge and then Chad wrote this crazy rap that ended up being performed by Miss Meryl Streep. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe be Into the Woods, there's a little witch's rap. Maybe Absolutely. <laughs> Not the first time she's done this, um, but it's, uh, you know, it was it was just kind of a, you know, we were all in different places. Adam was in Los Angeles. Chad was... Um, in the Hamptons, I think I was in New York and Pierre was in Sweden because almost the entire music team uh, for the movie is Swedish. Um, and uh, so it was just this back and forth for I think about a week or two where we were just kind of hammering it out. Um, and then we they presented it to Ryan and Ryan loved it. And then they cut it to picture and and it just, you know, it, ju it just is a joyful experience. And there's another song as well, isn't there, with, for James Corden? Yes. Gordon. Yeah, and then on the scrolling credits, it's actually a song that we wrote to be in the body of the film. Mm -hmm. um, but it, where it would have gone, it would have been like after Unruly Heart and after another scene that had a lot of emotion to it. And it was just probably one too many. Um, and because of COVID, we didn't even get to shoot it. So, um, but but I'm very grateful. It's on the in the in the end credits in the scrolling credits, and it's on the soundtrack. Um, and it's a song I'm really proud of. And it, it basically expands upon the moment in the show where Barry says, um, you're gonna lose your daughter if you don't accept who she is, you're gonna lose her. And Ryan asked us to write a song basically expanding on that moment. Um, and, and we did, and, I, and I, I actually am quite proud of that song. Now, all creators have to kill their darlings. That happens in every process. So tell yeah. me what you had to cut that, that you missed. Well, with not, none of the songs, weirdly enough. Every song is in there yeah. in some way. There are, there are some that absolutely are shortened. Um, you know, in a movie, you know, you have to keep moving things forward. You know, on, on, when you're doing something on stage, you can have plant somebody center stage and sing for four minutes and it's acceptable. But I think in a movie, um, if, if it's replaying the same beat, especially because you have uh, the ability to make a close up, um, some, you know, some things are shorter. I had no, you know, inclination that every song would make it into, into the movie. And it, and it did. And most of them are, are intact. Most of them are really intact. And also I will add that, um, every song is in the original Broadway key, except for we look to you, which actually went up 
for Keegan Michael. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was a really uh, extraordinary and, and quite faithful um, adaptation. So I really didn't answer your question. <laughs> well, I threw well, it maybe Bob, problem. are there lines <laughs> yeah. that are cut? <laughs> well, yeah, there are lines that are missing. But you know, I, I was actually uh, talking to Jack Fertel this morning, and he's the one who came up with the original idea for the whole sh thing, right? And we, and when he came to us with the idea, we kind of jumped on it because we have a tendency to write kind of smart ass material. <laughs> and so the, the Broadway show had this sort of uh, slightly anarchic smart ass tone and a lot of theater, inside theater material. It's a lot of inside theater jokes. So some of that tone is, you know, some of the smart ass material is removed and much of the insider material is removed. Um, like references to, you know, those of us who used to be called gypsies and things like that, mm -hmm. because Ryan was uh, consciously um, sort of re-sculpting the material for a more global audience and for a younger audience. Um, so uh, although there, there's a couple of lines that I miss just because, you know, I'm a comedian and I like, <laughs> <laughs> I like my jokes, uh, I still think he did this you know, he did the right thing. He, he's, he's, um, he's going to get to these kids, as he says, you know, the, the little, the kid in Croatia who is, you know, watching this and, and feels, um, included, sees himself in the film. I mean, he's, by making these adjustments, he's going to hit a larger audience. And that is, that is the most important thing. I mean, I really love the smart ass winking wit of the Broadway version, but I feel that this really did build a prom for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone exactly. can relate to it, you know? Yeah. It's such um, a celebration. Yeah. It's such a celebration and it really hits its emotional places. Um, I didn't think I would get teary, but I did. <laughs> Very yeah, I'm a sobbing mess. I'm a sobbing mess when I watch this movie. We Every look time. to you that the the way he shot that oh, sequence with yeah. Keegan going back and you know us seeing Swallow the Moon on stage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it was so moving. I mean, and yeah. Keegan, my God, he's he's damn good. Yeah, Dude, like, and they are all talking about Meryl, but Keegan is really fantastic in the movie. Uh, and yeah. they, you know, yeah, they all the whole cast is is wonderful. And uh, and there are so many moments that made me just long to be back in a theater. And yes. we kind of we yeah. kind of get to be for for a few moments in this film, and and I think it's really something we could all really use right now. It's a wonderful vacation from the COVID reality where we get to go back yeah. and see the prom, and it's so moving and so wonderful. You both should be so proud, and Chad and the whole team. It's fantastic. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, all right, everyone needs to see the prom. For all of those prom virgins out there, what do you want them to take away from this movie? Um, I, for me, it's just, you know, you having a better future just means choosing to have a better future. Mm -hmm. I think that's the central message of the film. And then, you know, that includes forgiveness and love and understanding, but it's really a choice in the end. Um, uh, so I hope that's what people take away. Thank you both so much for joining me. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much you. for having us. It's time to...